Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different and showing you exactly how this painting was made using only the standard brushes that come with Procreate. So let's get started. So this is a follow-up and in the last video I talked about the specific brushes that we're going to be using in today's painting. If you missed that video I encourage you to watch it now. Here's a link to it. And in that video, I discuss each brush and kind of how it, how it acts and why I think it is a good choice for replicating watercolors, at least sort of convincingly. And as just a reminder, this is not necessarily the workflow that I do now for creating my paintings, but it is the workflow that I started with. It's the workflow that I used to do before I had other brushes. And in another video, I know I've discussed my current workflow in a couple other videos, but not in any sort of structured way. So I think I'm going to do an actual video that <laughs> structures and explains how I go through my current process, but that will come a little bit later. So just for a quick recap, the brushes that we're going to be using today are peppermint for the sketching, tinderbox for inking, syrup for the gel pen sort of highlights, Marilla for general washes of color, R for shading and some details, and gouache for final details and smoothing out certain areas of the painting. Also in the last video I talked about uh, paper textures and downloading or scanning in your own and why they're so important for the painting process, especially for replicating any kind of natural media. And then I realized that that was kind of a dick move, so because it takes no effort pretty much on my end to upload the photos that I already have of paper textures that I've scanned in. So in the description box below, you'll see a link to two uh, paper textures that I have uploaded for you. It is a Gumroad link because that's just the easiest way to deliver it to you. But if you put zero in the little place where it asks for like payment, it'll take you right to the download page and you can have them for free. So hopefully that helps you out. As a little side note, they are both cold press watercolor papers. So if you know anything about uh, watercolor, there's hot press and cold press uh, papers, and the cold press papers tend to have more texture. So both of those are cold press. So as you can see, I chose a rather simple portrait for the reference. I found this on Pinterest, of course. And unfortunately, I don't know the uh, model or the photographer, so I don't know who to give the proper credit to, but I will link it in the description box below if you care to use the exact reference. And if you do happen to know who the photographer or model is, please let me know and I will be happy to give credit. But I am talking over the sketching phase. I'm using the peppermint brush for the sketch and I'm just talking over the sketch phase because this is not a drawing tutorial. I might do one of those in the future, but this video was already going to be very long. So in the interest of trying to not make it a decade long, I'm going to skip over the sketching phase and get straight to the painting phase. And that's where we are now. So I start with the Marilla brush. I set it to a rather high size because I'm going to be just creating the general wash for the background. So I'm gonna choose like a pink color. And remember that most of these brushes respond very well to pressure. So the harder you press with Marilla, the darker and larger the uh, paint stroke is going to be. So I usually start with a very light hand and kind of like vary my pressure as I go because I want varying degrees of opacity as I'm painting to kind of replicate that wet on wet effect that you get in watercolor. I am also going to be slightly shifting the shade of pink that I'm using or the hue of pink that I'm using as I go. Again, that replicates just um, traditional watercolor and as you're painting, the way that the pigment settles into the paper sometimes kind of gives it a varying effect in color. Once I feel good about the background, I will use the medium hard brush as an eraser, and that's found in the airbrushing category. And I will erase some of the background that bled into the subject of the painting, but not 100% because I do like to have a little bit of color bleed over just to help with the painting uh, cohesion so it looks like everything belongs within the painting. Some colors do bleed over into each other. Then I'll also add a wash of color for the skin and the jean sort of overalls using the same Marilla brush. 
can see I put a little purple arrow here and that is just a visual note for myself to remember where the light source is coming from so I know where to place the initial highlights and shadows. The hair is brown but it does have some significant red undertones so I am going to place down the initial wash of color for the hair as red and then I will build up the brown as I go. First pass of shadows is done with the Morilla brush and the same color that I used for the initial wash of color for the skin. But when you lay down a new layer with the Morilla, it deepens that color a little bit so it starts to add a little bit of shadow. I will do the same thing with the hair and you see that even though I didn't really change the color very much, it adds a brown to the hair just because of the multiply blend mode that's set as a default for Marilla. Now I'm gonna turn down the sketching layer a little bit just so I can kind of see what the painting looks like without the lines. And I'm gonna start adding the ink lines for the painting. This is a little bit different from the workflow that I have done up till now. My traditional workflow actually included doing the sketch first and then the ink first and basically creating a coloring page for myself with all of the ink outlines. But I have adopted a little bit of a different workflow in creating the sketch, then laying down some of the base colors for the painting, and then adding the ink lines. And the reason that I do that is because I kind of like to have the freedom when I am painting to create the forms as I see them as I go and let the painting kind of inform the outlines. Once I feel confident that I have the shapes and forms the way that I want them, then I will start adding the ink outline, which is what you're seeing now. And I am using Tinderbox for this ink outline. Now I will do what I call the, I guess, makeup phase of the portrait, but it doesn't necessarily have to be makeup. It could just be adding color to the skin so that it looks a little bit more alive. And in this case, I'm just going to add a little bit of pink color to various areas of the skin. Again, just to give it a little bit of warmth, as well as a little bit of shading to the eyelid. For this, I use the Tamar brush. And I paint down rather harsh shapes, and then I blend them out with the wet sponge blender. I'm now going to be starting on some of the more defined shading and I am still using the Tamar brush for this but I'm going to start with adding color to the lips, some shading to the sucker, and then I'm going to move on to shading, like coloring the nails and shading the hand and just work my way around the portrait like that. Now it's time to add a little bit more defined shadows to the portrait. And for this I like to use a hard light blending mode because it creates some really interesting color combinations and they can kind of surprise you sometimes. So I usually will choose a lighter kind of gray, cool gray color for shadows in this mode. You'll see that I struggle a little bit with choosing the right color, but once I have like this grayish purple color, I, I'm happy with the, with the color combination that it does with the skin underneath it. And I will do everything from the skin to the hair to the clothes in this hard light layer until I'm happy with it. And again, I am still using the Tamar brush. Sometimes I like to leave harder edges like on the side of the face to define the shadows. And sometimes I like to blend out the harder edges such as around the eyes or between the eye and the nose. That's really just a style choice. You can decide whether or not you want to blend out edges or keep them, uh, keep them with hard edges. So you'll see that now I am doing the shading of the hair. And again, I chose like a burgundy red color for the shadow, but because of the colors that I've already laid down and because I'm using the hard light blending mode, it creates more of a brown shading, which is exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. 
The way that I do eyebrows is to indicate them through the sketching and ink lines and then um, just kind of fill them in with a mid to dark tone from the hair color. I don't really spend a lot of time on them, I just basically want to indicate that they are there and the shape. I am also shading the jean color of the overalls with a gray blue. And I'm not very happy with the composition or layout or where the person is positioned on the canvas, so I am cropping and resizing it a little bit now to center her a little bit better. And I will create another layer, set it to multiply now. And now I'm going to switch over to the gouache brush. It is time to finally make the hair a little bit darker brown and also smooth out a little bit of the harsh texture that was created with the other two brushes that I used. So I am using a smaller size brush for the gouache and I am now painting in some of the darker shadows. Gouache is another one of those brushes that responds very well to the pressure that you place on the stylus or the pencil. I don't want to completely lose the character of the brush strokes that I have already laid down. So I do not use a like smooth single motion. I sort of gingerly paint in the shadows with shorter brush strokes. And that allows it to maintain a lot of the character that I've already kind of built into the piece with the brush strokes overlapping each other and the texture kind of like running into itself and maintaining again that watercolor feel that I'm going for. Never be afraid of that undo shortcut because I think that it is incredibly useful when it comes to digital painting. And I probably could edit the video to not show all of the times that I undid uh, brush strokes that I laid down, but I think that that would be a little bit inauthentic because I do use it. I utilize that undo a lot. So until I'm happy with what I have actually laid down. So I will show that in my painting processes. is each section that you've seen that that you see that I have drawn out with the line art is sort of a ribbon and all of those ribbons are pulled together in one cohesive shape but each ribbon kind of has its own way of interacting with the light source so you'll see that the highlights that I've done kind of in a zigzag pattern follow a pattern across the whole like curve of the head but each ribbon or section of hair has its own unique darkest spots and lightest spots. And that gives it a little bit more life and a little bit more of an organic feeling. Yes, I have to remember that even though the bun is its own separate shape on the uh, picture, it's still part of the same head of hair. So the darker parts of the shadows or the darkest shadows will be in the same area as the darkest shadows that are on the hair that's actually touching the head. So again, we still wanna follow the same general idea of where the light source is coming from and remember that the bun, even though it is its own separate shape, it is still part of the overall shape of the hair. This step is probably not really important or even required. It's something that I do sometimes in my watercolor paintings, especially when I'm dealing with lighter colored hair. I will switch back to the peppermint brush, which I usually use just for sketching. But in this case, I'm going to use it as sort of a colored pencil to aid in the, in the hair. And I'm gonna use it to draw individual strands of hair near the hairline to show that the hair is growing out of the hairline and it's not just like a smooth line where the forehead stops and the hair starts. And I'll also use the peppermint brush to draw in a few stray strands of hair to kind of give it a little bit more personality. I'm also using the tinderbox brush to create the eyelashes of the character. I usually save eyelashes for almost last, even after I have done all of the inking and sketching and most of the painting. Now is the final pass of what I would consider the drop shadows or the deepest shadows of the piece. And for that I usually use a deep purple. Whether it's a warm purple or a cool purple really depends on the composition and the colors that are surrounding it and the light source of course, but in this case it's a little bit more of a warm purple for the, the deepest parts of the shadows. And I will use this same color to add shadow to 
all of the picture and that kind of ties the whole thing together a little bit more with the color harmony. This is the last pass of shadows that I will do for the hair and this is again with the gouache brush and it is a very small setting and it is an actual like deep brown to kind of make this almost very close to like a black brown color. This is of course very similar to the reference photo that we saw at the very beginning that I turned off a long time ago. I kept a um, sort of an idea of the reference photo but when I am painting from reference it is not my goal really to to recreate the photo as I see it. That photograph already exists so I don't see a whole lot of reason for me to just recreate it. What I do instead is I call this more of a study and I will make some stylistic changes just based on how I want to draw the character and this one is of course very similar to the reference that we saw but I do turn off the reference photo rather early in the process because I don't want it to completely control the way that I create the painting. So I start with the reference to establish the shapes and the base colors and then I usually turn the reference off so that I can kind of freestyle the rest of the painting and paint it the way that I see it rather than the way that it is already presented. This part of the painting process might be considered a, I guess, a chore or a little bit tedious but actually one of the most enjoyable pieces or the most enjoyable parts of painting for me is detailing the hair. I don't know why I just love doing it so <laughs> the amount of time that I spend detailing hair never bothers me. If this is something that like you don't enjoy doing then you might want to change up the process for doing it but I like I said I really enjoy doing it. It's what I consider painting in the personality of the hair so I really like doing it. Finally, I'm going to just indicate the pupil of the eyes a little bit. Since the eyes are already a super dark brown, we don't have to draw in a harsh pupil. I'm just going to generally shade in the area where the pupil would be to kind of give an indication. Finally, I am once again going to crop and resize the photo because I'm not entirely happy with the composition. I want the character mostly to just be front and center and uh, taking up most of the image itself. So. She's off to the side and down a little bit and I want to fix that. Now comes a part of the painting that I think might also be considered tedious, but I think that it is a very important for achieving that uh, watercolor style effect that we are trying to get to. And also it is something that I enjoy doing, but I like to paint in what I call the embellishments. And that is something that I think needs to be done with the standard Procreate brushes. Again, if you have pre-made brushes that have these watercolor effects already built in, then you might not need to do this step. But basically the effects of watercolor as it dries, when it starts to get the ring of like a darker color, and you start to see like the areas where various paints started to dry earlier than others, or various paint strokes kind of like overlapped each other, that is missing from this piece and I personally believe that it makes it look a little bit flat. So I'm going to hand paint the embellishments now by basically using the gouache brush, drawing random organic shapes, and then blending out the edges a little bit, again with the wet sponge blender, so that they kind of fade into the, the background a little bit. And this is all done on a color burn layer. You'll also see that I paint in a couple of light colored splotches just to kind of indicate areas where water might have dripped onto the background and again that is just for adding a little bit of character to the background. Finally it's time to add the only layer that I'm going to place above the paper texture layer in this piece and this is what I will do with all of the pieces once I'm ready to add highlights. I put the highlights above the paper texture layer just because they're going to be almost white. I want them to be pretty dramatic. I want them to stand out. And the paper texture kind of tends to uh, dull them a little bit. So I will place this layer above everything else and I will switch to the syrup brush. This is just in a normal blending mode. And I will select a color that is almost white but not quite. I usually try to stay away from pure white and pure black in my pieces. Places that I commonly add highlights are of course the eyes, the nose, 
sometimes the cheekbone depends on how harsh I think that the um, the lighting source is going to be I will occasionally but very rarely add a rim light on the side of the face again that just depends on how harsh I want the light source to appear I will of course do highlights on things like nails or anything with the hard surface like the sucker and sometimes fabrics depending on what the fabric is jeans don't usually have like a, a harsh highlight so I'm probably not gonna add highlights to that but I will do a little tiny bit of highlight to what's supposed to be the white shirt. But I do draw the highlights on hair a little bit differently. I will let the highlight kind of fade into and out of the hair. So in order to do that, I will paint the highlight, which I don't usually just do a straight or solid line. I'll do a few lines to indicate hair strands that are catching the light. And then I will use the medium hard eraser to lightly erase the ends of those strokes to kind of show that the highlights are fading into and out of the hair. It can be very easy to overdo it with highlights on hair and I know that I have been guilty of this myself. So I do try to kind of restrain myself because it's so much fun in my opinion to do. I will also usually draw a few strands of hair that are just in this white or almost white color to show individual hairs that have kind of flown away from the overall shape of the hair and are catching the light. And at this point, my screen recording did cut out on me. I think I uh, ran out of memory, but the only thing that you missed was me signing the piece. You can see my name right there on her shoulder. That was literally the only thing that was missed. I also want to show really quick, in case you're ever curious, to know how long a uh, painting took you, especially if you're trying to do like studies or get faster at painting. You can always go to the wrench icon, click on canvas, and then click on statistics. And that will show you the total strokes made and the amount of time that it took you to make the painting. But that's the end of this tutorial, and if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below, and I will see you next time. Thank you.